Our lesson from the book of Numbers is a story wrapped up in another story. One story concerns the people, the Israelites. This plot line is about craving and the consequence of craving. The other is about Moses, the gift of shared leadership and the expansive nature of God's blessing. These two threads are twisted around each other and I'd like to tease them apart. So let's follow one thread at a time and let's start with the people. We're gonna have to come back a little and add some scripture to get the real sense of the story. So here we go. A year or two before our story today takes place, the Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt, brutally oppressed, forced into grueling, dangerous labor, beaten mercilessly, and finally, at Pharaoh's command, every baby boy born among them killed and thrown into the Nile. So it was bad, unmistakably, horrifyingly bad. But then God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of their ancestors with a strong hand and a mighty outstretched arm intervenes and sets them free. God sends Moses to lead the people out of slavery and by plague, Passover, and the parting of the Red Sea, lo and behold, it happens. They escape the torment of slavery and Pharaoh. And when they arrive safe and sound at the far side of the sea, they rejoice and shake their tambourines and sing and celebrate, offering praise to the Lord. And they promise to worship, follow, and love him and only him forever and always. God, for his part, promises to deliver them to a new land, a place of abundance where they can make a home, a place to grow and flourish and to live as God's people in shalom, in harmony and peace. But before they can arrive at that promised land, there is a journey through the wilderness that they must undertake. And so, although they are no longer slaves, praise the Lord, they find themselves in the desert, facing a difficult and uncertain journey. Both the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers speak of this wilderness desert time, but the tone and emphasis is different. In Exodus, the people complain, sure, but in numbers, they are rabble, rebellious, difficult, disobedient, sowing discontent and causing problems. Despite all of this, God sticks with them, leading them by fire and cloud, cloud and providing for their bodily needs. For sustenance, they receive manna from heaven, food from God. Scripture tells us that this strange and mysterious substance, once prepared and cooked, tasted like cakes baked with oil. Not bad for desert provisions. God gives them what they need for the journey, yet they cannot see, they don't believe that this is enough. And so they begin to crave. What God is providing is more than enough, but in order to really receive it, they must trust God. They must have more faith in the liberation and salvation of God than they do in the power and economy of Pharaoh, but they don't. Instead, the people begin to want what they do not have, meat. And then revisionist history and selective memory really kicks in. Remember the food, the fish, the melons? Gosh, I miss the food. And before long, they have convinced themselves that it was better to be a slave in Egypt. A craving is a compulsion that can only be satisfied by the specific object of one's desire. It is a longing for temporary pleasure. And this craving is so powerful that it causes the people to misremember what slavery was actually like. 
and for a taste of how it used to be, they would give up, forego their freedom. The people get more and more mean and murmury. They cry out to God and relentlessly badger Moses, demanding that, they, that he give them meat to eat. And lo and behold, they get what they ask for. Be careful what you ask for. Quail fall from the sky so many that the birds pile up three feet high all around the camp. They get so much meat, Scripture tells us, that it comes out of their noses. It chokes them. So much meat that it rots and makes them sick, and they begin to die. Scripture tells us that the location, the place where all of this happened, is named and becomes forever known as the grave of craving. The grave of craving. For it is here that they bury the ones who craved. The way the scripture is written, the glut of quail and subsequent deaths are attributed to the actions of God. And that sounds so harsh and weird to our modern ears, and it certainly pushes up against our belief in a God of love and mercy. But I want to suggest that if we just tilt our frame of reference a little, we might be able to make some sense of it. What if this story is operating more like a warning or a cautionary tale? What if getting the Israelites out of Egypt was the easy part, but getting Egypt out of the Israelites proves to be much harder? What if the journey from enslavement to freedom requires us to overcome our inner captors? And one of the forces that holds us captive is our craving for more and more, our nomadic desires, our compulsion for that which ultimately cannot save us, fulfill us, or make us whole, but for which we would sacrifice our freedom and deceive ourselves. Self-re-enslavement is not God's doing but the consequences are still deadly. The second story in our lesson from Numbers centers around Moses. Poor Moses. He is at the end of his rope. The weight and burden of this mutinous people, their endless need, the enormity of the challenges they face, it is more than he can handle. And Moses is finally ready to admit it, to give it up. And so he cries out to God and tells him just how powerless he really is. God, these are your people, and this is your promise. I am not God, and I cannot fix this. God hears Moses and responds. He tells Moses, gather 70 of the elders those whom you know to be respected leaders among the people, and have them take their place with you in the tent of the meeting. The elders gather, and then the spirit which is upon Rose, Moses, God extends and pours over all those gathered, so that together they may share the burden of leadership. And when the spirit rested on these 70, they prophesied, prophesied. That's one of those biblical words that I think makes us scratch our heads. It's kind of difficult to understand, but I'll take a crack. I'll tell you what I think of it. The way I think of prophecy and prophesying is like an enacted holy epiphany. To prophesy is to have such clarity and insight and connection with God that one can speak and guide and lead as God would have us to do. And for the 70 in the power of the Spirit gathered in the tent of the meeting, this is what happens to them. Wisdom and clarity and direction fill the leadership. Each is blessed with gifts from God, shared for the good of all of God's people. 
But just in case those in the tent get a little too big for their britches and start to think of themselves as an extra special elite, the Spirit also comes to rest on two people who are on the outside. You see, the Spirit of God moves on the inside and on the outside. The Spirit is present in the holy places and the Spirit is present in the world. And the Spirit also abides with those on the outside who bring a new perspective. Some followers of Moses, they don't understand this and they try to shut these outsiders down. But Moses, who finally gets that it's not his show, he says, don't be jealous for my sake. This gift is meant to be shared, not hoarded. Would that all God's people were blessed to speak and act and lead in truth and in love. Two threads we have today, two stories intertwined, one of self-destruction and one of transformation, and it's all tangled up together. This Sunday for us marks the beginning of Bless It Forward, our annual giving campaign. It is that season in the life of the church when we commit to one another to provide for the embodied physical and spiritual needs of the parish through the gifts of our time and talent and treasure. How do these intertwined plot lines, these stories from the wilderness speak to us in this moment? What can they tell us about the invitation to bless our community forward, to create for one another, with one another, a community that is more like the promised land, a place to grow and flourish, and a spiritual home of abundant life, ready to receive those who join us now and in generations to come. It seems to me that the first story thread, the people of the people's rejection of God's provision in favor of their cravings, asks us to consider what is enough? What is enough, really? Is there ever enough? There is a saying I heard once, the secret to true happiness isn't getting what you want, it's wanting what you have. Happiness isn't getting what you want, it's wanting what you have. Fulfillment, shalom, is to recognize, to love, to cherish what we have, and to receive these blessings not as entitlements, but as gift. Desire, wanting things, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Desire can be motivating, energizing, inspiring, especially when that desire is rightly ordered, as St. Augustine would say, a generative desire that seeks what is good and true, loving and life-giving. That kind of desire, that's all right. But acquisition is a fleeting pleasure, and it cannot make us whole. And compulsion Addictions of their many forms, perfectionism, power, control, status, craving, as scripture calls it, tells us a lie so powerful that we are in danger of becoming enslaved to it. Part of our personal discernment to bless it forward is to wrestle with and clarify what is enough, really, and then to name in our lives the provision of God. For it is from a recognized abundance, perhaps we might describe it as a modest surplus, that we are free to share our gifts, to offer our gifts to one another for the life of the church. Our giving, our generosity cannot be and is not compelled or guilted, or arm-twisted. It simply cannot be. Love does not work that way. 
Grace does not work that way. Sharing our gifts is an act made in freedom by the, by the unenslaved. And it is a spiritual practice that builds our resistance to those cravings that would lead us astray. The second story of Moses reminds us that the Spirit of God is not a finite quantity. The blessings bestowed on each and every one of us are not diminished when they are shared, only multiplied. And the second story also reminds us to be open and ready to receive the blessings of those outside the tent. In the economy of Pharaoh, it's a zero-sum game. If I have more, you must have less. But Pharaoh is not our God. Our God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, one God, whose very being is an endless procession of gift. Love, loving love, loving love, loving love, giving and receiving, receiving and giving, giving and receiving, receiving and giving, on and on, eternal blessing and beatitude. Trinity, God's own self, is so full of light and love and gift that the whole creation pours forth in blessing so that as gift and love, we live and move and have our being. We belong to an economy of grace where every gift genuinely offered, no matter how big or small, has the power to bless us forward. Our economy of grace, we participate, we take part in every other gift of love, all the gifts offered by our brothers and sisters. We share in everyone's gift so that all of us have a share in every enacted ministry of the church, a hand in all of the blessings that pour forth from this place. The burdens we bear together in the power of the Spirit are lightened, and the blessing we become is more glorious than any one of us alone. As good stewards of the manifold gifts of God, let us serve one another. Whatever gift we have, it is enough, and together, let us bless it forward. Amen.